Hello, I am Dr. Paulette Hazier, Chief of the Geography and Map Division at the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you to GIS Day 2020, Mapping the Pandemic. The Geography and Map Division has been sponsoring GIS Day talks for more than a decade, many of which, like today's program, have concerned themselves with important applications of GIS and cartography to the critical issues of the day. This year, we are presenting four speakers who are at the front line of using GIS and cartography to help understand the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank them and all of you for participating here today. Happy GIS Day, everyone. It is my honor to have this opportunity to celebrate this day meant to build awareness about the various uses of GIS in organizations around the world. This year, GIS has been front and center in health in particular, and the fight against the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, which has commanded so much of our global attention. And perhaps you'll find it a bit ironic that this all happened in the year 2020. I'm sure you've all seen the memes in which people are sharing their frustrations regarding this challenging year by likening 2020 to a four letter word. Well, today to the extent possible, I'd like to put a positive spin on this year and think about how GIS has brought increased clarity to our lives in ways that not only helped us to respond to the pandemic, but also have the potential to significantly enhance our future resilience. If I were to put it very simply, I'd say that GIS helps us go beyond collecting the dots, which is something that health organizations are very good at doing. With GIS, we can use place and location analytics to connect the dots to create new insights, new information, and informed action. So let's test this thought for just a moment. What might the world look like uh, without GIS? Well, this here is one example, data that resides in a spreadsheet or a PDF document. Well, if we add graphics, it can really help make greater sense of the data and it improves our vision and the ways that we connect the dots. But it simply doesn't hold a candle to the way that geographic information puts data into context, showing how places compare, what the trends are in the short term and in the long term. Now, if you just look at this last graphic for a moment and focus on California, you are seeing and interpreting data from 928,000 cases across 58 counties over more than 280 days. I mean, geographic data provides something special that helps us to understand patterns and relationships and use that information to intelligently respond. And people did just that. And I'd like to show you a short video highlighting some of the innovation that we saw early on in this crisis.
So how did it all start with COVID-19 and the geographic innovations that helped us to connect those dots? Well, to summarize, I'd say that it started with a bang and it moved very fast. Starting here with the world famous, and in fact, I'd say iconic Johns Hopkins University dashboard. This dashboard built with GIS technology is the most viral map-based application in history. And it really woke up the world to the evolving outbreak. Now they collected the dots for sure, and they continue to do so to this day. And one thing that's so important about this dashboard is that from the beginning, the JHU team made sharing those dots their first priority. Now this engaged uh, or enabled all kinds of organizations to engage, to connect the dots through their visualizations, their analysis and their planning scenarios that really enhanced their decision-making for their own localized uh, COVID-19 responses. The dashboard had tremendous uptake. It quickly became a backdrop in operations centers around the world, from the US Health and Human Services Secretary's Operations Center to emergency response meetings that were held in Germany and coronavirus briefings going on in Italy. It was a backdrop in Ireland among so many others. The influence of this dashboard broadened when respected journalists started writing about it and the coverage was extensive, but a few notable examples included the New York Times, BBC World News, and our own Esri website used it for a landing page that we had focused on COVID-19 resources. The story of the dashboard was featured on National Public Radio. It was in Science, Nature Index, and the Wall Street Journal, among many other publications. And actually, I was even invited to talk about the dashboard and mapping of coronavirus on CNBC News. The dashboard went viral very quickly. This graphic is showing you the first three months of feature requests starting from the dashboard's introduction. Now just take a really close look at the scale on that vertical axis. Each division is actually 500 million feature requests. Now at a peak in late March, the dashboard was being requested four and a half billion times per day. Now compare that to the current world population and you'll start to get a good sense of how remarkable those numbers are. Beyond alerting the world to the developing crisis, the JHU dashboard inspired others around the globe to configure their own dashboards, to map and monitor the disease, uh, like this one that you're seeing built by the Africa CDC, showing their COVID-19 status for an entire continent with the option to focus in on various regions across Africa. In South America, we can look at the country scale and see that Colombia is paying close attention to the origin and importation of cases. In Australia, for the state of New South Wales, the University of Sydney took their analysis all the way down to the postal code. In Asia, Hong Kong is sharing data on cases and hospitalizations, of course, and they're also mapping the actual buildings where there have been confirmed cases. Here in North America, the state of Maryland shares data at the zip code level, along with detailed information on testing volume and the percent of positive tests. As a leader in transparency, the state is also sharing this dashboard, indicating ventilator trends and ventilator availability, as well as this remarkable dashboard that's giving us statistical information for each and every nursing home. So you can see across every continent and at every scale, even all the way to here, to the region of Timbuktu in Mali, people have been using map-based dashboards to understand the novel coronavirus. And people learned a lot from these dashboards and the experience of using geospatial information inspired them to see things a little bit differently and the GIS innovation uh, for COVID-19 started to evolve. 
Now, with COVID-19, governments wanted to start better understanding gaps in services or health outcomes, who is more or things likely, who is more or less likely to be affected. Now, those that are more likely to be affected by something are considered our vulnerable populations. And with COVID-19, people can be vulnerable for any number of reasons, and we can visualize and analyze those. Now, it may be older age or medical comorbidities that make some more susceptible to severe disease. People might be vulnerable because they're essential workers and they're more likely to be exposed to the virus. Or perhaps the vulnerability is because they live in a congregate housing situation like nursing homes, university dormitories, or prisons. We can overlay all of these various vulnerabilities to find the highest risk places for COVID-19. Now, people also used analysis to perform capacity forecasting. And this is where uh, you can take a model that pulls in hospital bed utilization data along with social distancing behaviors and understand what might happen over time with local hospital bed capacity. Now, every hospital and every government wanted to predict whether their curve was gonna stay flat, uh, maintaining that health system's ability to care for each and every person that walks through their doors, or if some hospitals may become overwhelmed and exceed their capacity to provide care. But capacity goes even beyond the idea of looking at hospital beds and looking at ventilators. Uh, it also includes the availability of personal protective equipment. Simple survey tools that are connected to dashboards help collect and then manage the critical supply inventories uh, that could be for each hospital within a health system or all of the hospitals in a jurisdiction. And it allowed them to report uh, in regional or national ways to get a more cogent uh, big picture. Now, it turns out that two staples of geographic problem solving are site selection and calculating the geographic accessibility for places. Now, these methods have been used for things like standing up new testing sites, distributing different kinds of food resources, and extending healthcare services in those places where hospital capacity actually does become overwhelmed. Now, to do this, it uses a process called location allocation. Let's say that we want to stand up new testing centers. We would begin by determining the population demand, or you might say the population need actually, for this service. And we can do this by overlaying all of the factors that are contributing each of the five COVID risk types. That is transmission risk, socioeconomic risk, susceptibility to the disease risk, exposure risk, and resource insufficiency risk. Now, in the end, these create a risk ranking over small geographies, let's say neighborhoods, that you can use in the next part of the analysis. So to calculate the best testing center locations, you pull in those risk rankings that you just calculated, and then you look at things like road network data, so you can calculate drive times and drive distances to your new centers. Then you input any constraints that you may have for your model. Let's say you only have a budget for 10 new sites, or maybe you only have staff that can uh, support five new sites. You put all of those different kinds of constraints in, and the model will take them all into consideration and select the most optimal sites from your entire population of options. So you've done all of that, you've placed your sites. Well, how do people find the resources that they're going to need? Well, they can use what we call resource locators like this one that came from Valencia in Spain. When placing a pin on the map, the user can get information about the nearest hospital, uh, pharmacy, social services, or testing sites, and uh, it's in their immediate area. So uh, looking at all of these things, I think there's no question that COVID-19 
inspired great innovation in connecting the dots to support response to the pandemic. Now, here's an application that I'd like to show you with several innovations combined. You're seeing the state of California with social distancing grades over time, where a red indicates an F grade and blue is an A grade. This comes from aggregated and anonymized cell phone data. Well, we can add information like the date that California put their stay at home order into effect. And then you can start to see that the coastal counties did pretty well with social distancing, while the inland counties did a little bit less well with their social distancing measures. Well, then something happened a little bit uh, later toward the end of April, and we can add that to the map. We started to see crowds at the beaches in California. So you wanna think about what are these influences on uh, social distancing behaviors? Well, the weather certainly came into play here. So we can add data that comes from NOAA to examine the weather patterns. We can build that up over three dimensions and over time in a, a layer that we call a voxel layer. That's really the combination of volume and a pixel to create a voxel. So the dark orangey brown areas are higher temperatures and the blue areas are lower temperatures. And now you can start to make visual comparisons. Now I will tell you that Esri headquarters is in San Bernardino County and we're gonna focus in on that county and oh, there you go. Um, it turns out that as the weather got warmer, San Bernardino County uh, started heading to the beaches maybe. Um, maybe with some of my Esri colleagues, I don't know. But this kind of information I think you can see not only helps you to understand at a deeper level what's going on, but potentially put into place new policy initiatives. Well, I know that a lot of people are wondering uh, what does the future hold? Well, the first thing that I'll mention is the vaccine for this virus. The trick is, how can we distribute a vaccine to all of the people of the world in a way that is equitable and ends the pandemic as soon as possible? Now, there are some really very complex and challenging issues in this whole vaccination effort that GIS can nicely support like identifying the facilities that can store and administer vaccines, determining where the concentrations of high priority populations are, and exposing gaps in access to vaccine, formulating plans so that we can reach everyone. GIS can also help manage and monitor the vaccine administration and inventory system, as well as share progress on vaccination delivery across our communities. One of the key tasks for health departments will be to figure out how to prioritize vaccine delivery in a way that ends the pandemic as quickly as possible, as I mentioned before. Now this means considering vaccinating healthcare workers who are on the front line first, then prioritizing other populations in consideration of things like those most likely to suffer severe disease like the older adults, people who are most exposed like essential workers, and those most likely to transmit disease like people in congregate housing situations. GIS can make understanding where all of those populations are much easier. Now, once you know where all those critical populations are, and perhaps you did some of that location allocation I talked about, to find all of the best vaccine venues where you're going to be able to administer the vaccine, well, that's when you can start to calculate things like their reach, how many of the critical population can be served by each of your vaccine venues. Now, it's inevitable that there will be gaps. Some populations are gonna be out of reach of the vaccine venues and we can make plans to site new vaccine venues and see how well we can serve that underserved population. We could also partner with locations that already exist like retail pharmacies who may be able to support a broader distribution for some difficult to reach populations. Our fourth key task is to talk about 
uh, tracking and managing the vaccine inventory, along with the vaccine distribution kits and the PPE equipment needed to be able to safely administer vaccine. Easy to use mobile tools can read the barcodes on the vaccine cartons and it can parse out the information into relevant fields like the quantity, the lot number, and the expiration date. Now this is going to make inventory check-in really quite quick and easy. In the very same way, inventory can be checked out when supplies are taken from that inventory and are ready for use out in the field. All of this movement of supplies is monitored in real time with connected dashboards. As this enormous global challenge continues to evolve, it's gonna be really important for decision makers to constantly evaluate the process and the productivity of each vaccination venue. And I think it's gonna be equally important to share vaccine progress with the public um, and keep them well informed of what's going on and why certain decisions are being made. Now, speaking of vaccines, did you know that childhood immunizations are decreasing uh, during the pandemic? And this is really just one of several health issues that are worsening due to COVID-19. Now, I call these ignored health needs, the COVID orphans. People are delaying their um, important health needs like cancer screening and chronic disease management. They're suffering from the mental health burdens related to the pandemic, which are leading to increased substance misuse and depression. It's really pretty easy to see how this could happen when all of our attention seems to be focused in just one direction, but the results could be dire. And so we need to encourage people to reconnect with their healthcare. Now, one way that that can happen is through changes in healthcare delivery. And we're seeing that there's a lot of healthcare organizations who are ramping up on their telehealth and their e-health options. Well, folks are using GIS to determine if there's sufficient need for those kinds of services by assessing things like the travel burden across their communities, uh, checking to see if their broadband coverage is adequate and refining the service offerings by understanding the underlying population health needs. This is really pretty much the same pattern that I showed you for determining the COVID-19 testing center locations or planning vaccination venues. These methods are actually quite repeatable for many different kinds of health challenges all the way from Hippocrates in the fifth century BC to modern days. The connections between health and place are strong and they go well beyond all of the amazing work that's been done for COVID-19. People are doing things like providing community resources to patients and mapping social vulnerabilities and disparities. They're improving access to healthcare and planning new resources to address various risk factors for things like homelessness. They're plotting preferred mosquito habitats, understanding what mosquitoes like and don't like, and then using that to prepare control measures to decrease the risk for Zika virus, dengue fever, and chikungunya. The benefits of making stronger connections between health and place are great. So in this unprecedented year, 2020, we've seen some of the tremendous power and understanding that applied GIS can bring to our world. At the same time, our technology gaps have become clearer and I think we need to ask ourselves a few questions. Were we as prepared as we could have been? How can we better interconnect our systems at all levels and support a clear need for finer scale and real-time mapping? Can GIS help us better coordinate our responses across governments and various scales? How can we do a better job of sharing authoritative data that everyone can use to make better decisions? 
As a group of GIS enthusiasts, I think we can all contribute to incorporating these lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 into our organizational workflows in a way that will prepare us for whatever comes next. Because it's really never been enough to simply collect the dots. We need technologies like GIS to support health by helping us to connect the dots in ways that inform, inspire, and initiate change that makes us all healthier. And with that, I wish you all a very happy GIS day. Hello, I'm Anshan Don. I'm the second year PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. Today, I would like to share some background stories about our world-famous coronavirus dashboard. In this presentation, you will know how we got started with this dashboard, who our users are, the data collection and sharing strategy, and the challenges we have been facing and how we solve them. First, let's take a look at the dashboard. You may have been very familiar with this dashboard back to January. The main part of this dashboard um, is the map, and each red dot represents the total number of the um, cases in that location. For example, we are tracking the US at the county level, Canada, Mexico, uh, the UK, Australia, China, and several other countries are at the subnational level, for, for instance, the province or the state level and the rest of the world, we are tracking at the country level. Um, and for the country level, we call that admin zero level. On your left-hand side and right-hand side next to the map, you can see several lists of numbers. They include total cases, death, recover cases for each country or region. Uh, we also have US specific list, which include cases, death, recovered cases, testing rate, but they all at the state level. At the lower right corner of the uh, dashboard, you will see a couple of epidemiology curves. We provide bar charts for daily cases and death, line plots for the total cases and death, and the log plot for the total cases too. Down below the map, you can see uh, we have separate tabs, and each of them is a map with other epidemiology variables and they provide you a different perspective of understanding the coronavirus. The first map would be active map. Active cases means the number of the total cases minus recovered cases minus the death. And the second one is an incidence rate map. Incidence refers to cases per 100,000 persons. And the third one is the case fatality ratio which is calculated by the number of recorded uh, deaths over the number of cases. And the last one is the testing rate. And this is a US state level only. We also collaborate with uh, GHU Coronavirus Resource Center and the Civic Impact. And here uh, is the US coronavirus dashboard. Uh, this provides more detailed information about the lo lo local demographics, public health facilities, and other information. For example, if you click on the county here in the map, you will see a pop-up window. And in the pop-up window, click on the infographic and you can get more information for that county. For example, the number of the uh, residents and the number of the beds, the number of the physicians in that county. So this one is really helpful for the researchers to, to conduct a further understanding of the coronavirus. Many people ask us why you started this coronavirus, coronavirus dashboard. And this is because uh, my advisor, Dr. Lauren Garner, and I, we had a meeting back to January 21st. Uh, Dr. Garner bought me a cup of coffee in the library, and uh, we were discussing about what we should do next semester. And in the meeting, I told her I was collecting the data of the coronavirus, and she suggested me to create a dashboard. And uh, I'm so happy on that. And right after the meeting, I created the first version of the dashboard. And on the second day, January 22nd, Dr. Garner 
uh, posted the tweet and to promote our dashboard. Since then, the Johns Hopkins University and the Lancet Infectious Disease, they all tweeted our dashboard. So how many users or how many clicks we have been received? This is the usage graph in the early days. You can see the highest daily request can go up to four and a half billion. Compared with the world population, you can get a sense of how many, uh, almost every one in the world has a click on our dashboard. And uh, as of November 2nd, for the feature layers, we received approximately 200 billion requests. So that's a really impressive number. If I break down the usage into countries, as you can see, each color represents a region or a country, and the up and down go with the surge of the coronavirus. For, ex for instance, when Italy got the first coronavirus, we got a surge, and the most users are from Europe. And the second surge in Europe, Union, and the Middle East, we have another surge. When the US uh, got the first surge in early March, and we have another surge from the US. Who our users are? And this is one of our users, um, Vice President Mike Pence. When he was visiting uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the background is our dashboard. And this is in Germany government when they are discussing uh, the policies to control the coronavirus. And here is another photo from the Italian cabinet. Uh, the leader of the government, they were also using our dashboards to discuss the solutions to control the coronavirus. And you can see in the early, in, in the early days, there are um, so many um, public available aggregated sources for the coronavirus. So the leaders worldwide, they rely on our dashboard as the only one reliable and in real time updated data source. And this, uh, the same thing is for the United Nations stats. We are also very proud that our data has been used to make projections. For example, uh, the left one is from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from University of Washington. They are using our data to make the projection for the future um, coronavirus situation. And their results has been used uh, by White House. And also our data is adopted by the projection from the CDC projection groups. Uh, like New York Times, they are using our data for the global coronavirus case tracking. And this is a typical CNN screenshot. And you can see our number is always shown up on the upper left corner. And below our data is the stock market. Sometimes you can see when the coronavirus cases is going up and the stock market tendency is going down. And our story is also reported by the NPR. This one is reported by Melissa Block, one of the very famous reporters in, from NPR. And uh, our story is also covered by Science Magazine and the Natural Index, and uh, with, along with a variety of other media. And the Wall Street Journal, they even call us the historical first. That's how I got my title, historical first. Some other similar dashboard inspired by our dashboard. So for example, this one is from the UN, uh, WHO from the early days. They adopt the similar layout of the dashboard. And this is from Japan. And this one is from Hong Kong. And this one is from Macau. This one from China CDC. They all use use the similar layout or design of the dashboard to make the public informed. And this one is from Italy, Singapore, Thailand, and uh, Israel. You can see for Thailand and Israel dashboard, they adopt our data by using their own languages. And this one is for the Philippines, and another one is for South Korea. As you all know, the coronavirus data is very important to set up the dashboard. There is an old saying, garbage in and garbage out. So since from the beginning, we are very um, cautious on the data quality of the dashboard. 
So as you can see in the early days of the dashboard, we are manu manually collected all the data. Uh, we use a Google Sheet to help us to allocate the tasks. For example, on uh, each Google Sheet, you can find who is the reviewer and uh, which region he or she is working on and what the data source is. So this one help us to can trace back to each cases uh, during that time. As the cases is becoming more and more, and especially for the US, we decided to track at the county level. And you know, in the US, we have more than 3,000 counties. It's kind of impossible for us to track the cases manually. So we adopted an automation process. There are three major blocks in this new automation process. Data collection, data curation and sharing, and visualization. In the first procedure, data collection, we are getting the data from the uh, local health departments and the major news media. We collect all the information, translate the language, and the unify standardize all the format into one. And then we post all the data into the GitHub. That's in the data curation process. In the GitHub, we share the data into two into two formats. One is the daily report, which has the, all the raw data each day you are you are seeing in the dashboard. And the other one is a time series table. This one is designed for the researchers. Whenever they have the access to the time series table, they can download the table, open in Excel, and the, and the draw the time series plot easily in the, in a Microsoft uh, Excel table. And then we're also sharing the data through the RPS hosted feature layer. This one enable the government agencies or the third party to use our data with the geolocations. While we are collecting all the data, there is another very important procedure, which is the anomaly detection. Why that's important? Because sometimes you will see some weird uh, data coming in. For example, if a location normally have only 100 cases reported daily, but someday they reported 1,000 cases. This is really uh, suspicious. And if that happens, our team member will jump into the data and see if that's an error because of our pipeline or because of the data source. When we uh, find out the solution, we will push the data manually to the system. This is anomaly detection. And uh, right now, it's partially automated. After we are sharing the data, um, collect the data, and sharing the data, and uh, we are making the data to the ArcGIS platform and making two versions of the dashboard. One is the uh, desktop version. The other one is a mobile version. You can switch different versions by clicking the button at the upper, uh, upper right corner of the dashboard. And we are also proud that in our GitHub repo got over uh, 24,000 stars, and uh, we were even ranked number one in their training list. Someone may be asking me why you switch from Google Sheet to GitHub. Well, the reason is very straightforward and simple because Google Sheet can, can only afford the first 100 users to download our data, which means uh, the 100 first user, he or she can only uh, read the data but they will never get a chance to download the raw data. It's not very convenient. Uh, because of the uh, scope of our users, we decided to move from the Google Sheet to the GitHub. As you can see, uh, since the early February, we are tracking the data and provide the data in the GitHub repo. Every day, we are doing that. And we will keep working on, our, keep working on that until the end of the pandemic. Here is an here is a, a overview of the GitHub. If you log into our GitHub, and you can see we are sharing data um, in three different folders. The first and the second, they are raw data from the dashboard. The first one is um, is for the whole data for the whole world, and the second one is U.S. only, because sometimes uh, researchers uh, prefer the to study the US data because US data has the county level and state level uh, is in a much more spatial resolution. And the, the third one is the time series table. So we include the global, uh, global cases and global deaths and the US 
cases and U.S. deaths, and also for the recovered cases. For all the data sources, we are ma also making a list in the GitHub. You can see we have the aggregated data sources and the U.S. specific data sources. So sometimes for each state, we are referring the data from both the state level uh, health department and also the local health department. So we all list the data sources here. Recently, we updated our terms of use. Um, previously, we only allowed our data to be used in the non-commercial uh, organizations or only the educational purpose. But right now, we are opening our data to almost in all organizations and uh, persons in the world. And uh, Google Map is one of our first users under the new terms of use. And uh, they use our data to show the coronavirus cases in the Google Map app. So right now, if you turn on the Google Map and tap on the layers button, and you can choose the COVID-19 information, and we'll show you the detailed information uh, of the coronavirus tendency in your location. From a geographer perspective, we always meet many challenges. Um, here, I will show you something. Uh, you, here, I give you two different uh, dashboards. If you are tracking us, you, will, you, you can tell the first one, the left one is the first version of the dashboard. Compared with the latest version, we changed a lot. For example, the, the default extend, we changed from the Eastern Asia to the whole world. And we also add many epidemiology variables, such as the global total cases, the global death, global recovered. And we also have a plot for the daily cases and daily death. Those are all the improvements, and some, some of them, they are requested by the users. Um, here, I will give you an example about the uh, geolocation. When the US government decided to evacuate um, some patients from the Diamond Princess back to the US continent, um, we, want to, um, we want to denote those uh, cases on the map. However, those cases, uh, they were allocated to different military bases or different hospitals uh, countrywide. So it's really hard for us to track their locations. Even though we can uh, make a dot of the, each patient on the map, it's kind of violates to the person's privacy because it's really easy to find we have a patient in search military base and he or she might be the only one and it's easier for for the public to find or trace uh, her name or his name. So it's not very good for the privacy protection. So how we did in that scenario, we aggregate all the cases into one dot, and that dot we placed in the geological centroid of the US, which is somewhere in Kansas. That might be a temporary solution because the second day in the morning, the residents of the Kansas in that location emailed us and, and told us, we don't have any coronavirus in our apartment. Why you place a dot on top of our apartment? Well, we recognize the situation. So we have to move this dot back to Japan where the Diamond Princess cruise ship was. Uh, however, uh, that's not very um, informative because that's not the real locations of those patients. Uh, eventually, we adopt a technology called null island which means you won't see those patients on the map because their location is kind of a privacy related but at the same time uh, we can show the data in the list so the total number of the patients will be counted toward the total number of the cases however they won't be show up on the map this is our solution uh, another visualization or the cartography related issue is uh, the level of the dot. Previously, I mentioned for the US, we are tracking the coronavirus at the county level. However, some places they don't provide the county level information. For example, in Utah, some users ask us where, where are the cases for certain counties? I cannot find that on the map. That's the reason because of the uh, Utah Department of Health, they only provide the cases at the jurisdiction district level, like here. So we follow the state's guidance and only report the cases uh, for those uh, jurisdiction level instead of the county level.
Um, the data validation, this is another very important data uh, strategy to tell us if our data is reliable and reported in real time. We compared our data with WHO. Uh, in the early days, you can see our bar charts uh, kind of a match with the next day's bar chart of the WHO, which means our data is accurate, but we report the cases much earlier than WHO. And another example is we are catching up, the, catching up with the latest criteria faster than WHO. For example, you can see a couple of spikes here. This is the China data in the early days. Um, the orange color, orange bars are JHU data and the blue bars are WHO's data. We catch up the, um, the criteria change for the confirmed cases much earlier than WHO's. So that's why we have a couple of extra bars previous than WHO. And um, we also compare when the country or region received their first coronavirus cases. Um, from this graph on the lower right corner, you can see uh, all the blue countries, that means uh, JHU CSS E data is reporting the first case of that location earlier than WHO. And the red ones means uh, we are a little behind WHO. One reason is in the early days, especially uh, in January, all the data is collected by myself manually. And I do remember Australia got the first case on a Saturday morning and I was so exhausted that morning collecting all the data, collecting data for the whole week. And I missed the first cases in Australia. Uh, but Dr. Garner called me and, and asked me, hey, Enshan, uh, wake up and uh, get updated for the first case of Australia. And I did it, but it's still a little late on the same day. Um, so we published our comparison um, in the Lancet Infectious Disease. And up until now, we received more than 2,000 citations, which is very impressive. For the US data, uh, we have uh, comparisons with other uh, data sources. For example, the US, US Facts, New York Times, and the COVID tracking project. Uh, as you can see, most of the time we are kind of along with, with each other, uh, but sometimes uh, some data set is higher than the others. That's the reason because of, that's the reason because of the probable cases. Maybe some data sets, they don't recognize the probable cases as the total cases. Another interesting example is the France data. Compared with WHO, you can see we have a huge spikes compared with their reports. That's the reason uh, we report both the cases, confirmed cases, and the probable cases at the total number of the cases. If you take a look on the right, that's the, how the French um, health department report their case. Uh, the light blue block means the confirmed cases inside of the hospital and outside of the hospital. And the dark blue one, the dark blue boxes, means all the cases, both the confirm, which means the confirmed cases and the probable cases outside of the hospital. As you can tell, there, there are some overlap between those two blocks, the light blue one and the dark blue one. And the overlap will be the confirmed cases outside of the hospital. So if we want to get the cases, which means both the confirmed cases and the probable cases inside and outside of the hospital, we need to figure out what the overlap numbers are. But the French government or the major media, they never report such a such number. So we have to ask our volunteers whose mother tongue is French and then listen to a news briefing every day and to figure out what the exact numbers is. So we update our data accordingly. Another reason why our French report is higher than WHO is uh, we are using um, the US Department, uh, State Department naming convention, which means all the overseas territories of the France, we, there, the cases from, from them are counted towards the French total cases. So that's another reason our numbers are higher than WHO. Uh, here is another example of Cyprus, you can see our data works perfectly with WHO data, but if you are familiar with the geopolitics of a Cyprus island, you, you can see uh, there are 
maybe uh, several political entities on the same island. We are not so sure. The data we collected is only for the uh, the south part or for the whole island. Uh, luckily, we have uh, I have a classmate, and uh, his father is a uh, is a Greek diplomat, and he has some connection with the Department of the House of the Republic of Cyprus. From his connection, we got to know all oh, this data is collected only for the Republic of Cyprus instead of the whole island. And we may also face other challenges, like can can, can you, Iranian people use our dashboard under the U.S. international law? And another interesting data collection is, should we report the cases uh, from Crimea to Ukraine or to Russia? So because of the uh, geopolitical uh, issues, we have to we have to pick up how we name them. So we decided to use the U.S. Department of the State's naming convention and solve all the problems. Another um, challenge we've been facing is we when to update the data cases. For instance, um, in the early days, if we only used uh, uh, midnight Eastern U.S. Eastern time to update update the data, um, you will see the time we update the data cases. The western part of the U.S. has not been updated their cases yet, so that maybe give you some gap. And also for some other countries like India, they are reporting their data irregularly. Um, sometimes it's at the three uh, three a.m. UTC. Sometimes it's later. So when we report the data cases. We may only catch up with the old data, or we may catch up two days information. We are constantly updating our uh, daily update time. Um, because of that, we uh, list all the data modification uh, in the GitHub repo. So all the users, if you have any questions on our data, like the French or the India or the time or the frequency, updating frequency, you can refer to our data modification records and to get more information. So ever since we started this project, everything is new because there is no other studies has been done previously for us to make a reference. For example, um, the parameter definitions is really um, ambiguous because there is no standard, standard line. Um, for example, for the date, uh, how, what do you mean a date? Is that the report date or the onset date or the GHU uh, collection date? So we have different definitions on that. We have to standardize that. And another thing is the discrepancies in reporting a, a, across different resources. For example, in the state of Texas, they are reporting Harris County with one number. For the Harris County, they are reporting following another standard. So they they always have a gap between the state reporting and the county reporting. How can we deal with that problem? And another challenging could be the, in, the inconsistencies in reporting medium. If, if all the local health departments, they are using um, the ESRI platform or a certain standardized platform, that will be much make our life much more easier, but things not always the case. For example, uh, some location, they prefer to use a PhD file. It's really hard for us to script the data from a PhD, uh, sorry, the PDF file. Uh, and sometimes they report the cases um, in the Facebook or the Twitter. Mm, it's not very formal, but we have to assign uh, real people to look at their Facebook or Twitter social account and to get the exact numbers. This is not very convenient. In the future, we hope uh, most organizations about the public health, they can unify their reporting system. Another concern is on the privacy. Should we report the, uh, should we report the cases for a county with less than five cases? That's something we need to consider. And then uh, we need to standardize the whole reporting system. And who should report the cases? Should the government work on that or local health department or uh, third party organizations? Those are all the things we need to discuss. So recently we published a paper um, in the 
learn certain practices to to discuss all those questions. You're welcome to take a look. And you're also welcome to take a look at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Center, where you can get more information of the data and the plot and the other latest technology to handle the coronavirus. I would like to say thank you to our JHU CSSC Center and also Applied Physics Lab and also ASRI. They provided many technical support to our dashboard. We also um, are grateful to our supporters. Because of their support, people will see Johns Hopkins is not a medical school. They see us as a coronavirus map school. Recently, we received the Making a Difference Award from ASRI, and this is all our lovely team members. And I'm so proud that my advisor, Dr. Garner, she was on the list of the Time 100 most influential people in 2010. For more information, you're welcome to visit our systems website at systems.ghu.edu. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, I hope you're enjoying the virtual edition of GIS Day 2020. Um, in this brief presentation, we're going to be talking about supply chain at a pretty introductory level, uh, specifically as it relates to COVID-19. So hopefully by the end of all this, you'll understand how location intelligence is a critical element when designing a supply chain that is resilient uh, to get materials like vaccines and protective equipment to the right people at the right time. Um, but before we dive into that, uh, who am I? Um, so my name is Mike Scholl and I'm a solution engineer uh, with Esri Health and Human Services. Um, my team, alongside of our disaster response program, uh, have been working almost around the clock with federal agencies and local governments uh, to uncover how GIS can be applied to solve the tough challenges related to supply chain uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, prior to coming to Esri, I was actually the contracted GIS administrator for a branch at the Defense Health Agency um, on the integrated biosurveillance team. Uh, and then actually prior to that, I actually worked at the Library of Congress, um, more recently as a, a contracted GIS administrator with the, the GHE project. Um, but before that, I was a research fellow um, alongside of Evan, Aaron, and Amanda in that picture, um, digitizing content down in the Geography and Maps Division. So it's, it's really great to be back. Um, so while I have been around the block a good bit in GIS, I do want to highlight something small. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, now, I, I want to highlight that for two reasons. Uh, number one, don't take any medical advice from me. Um, but number two, if you understand GIS, you don't have to be a subject matter expert to assist in solving some of the world's toughest challenges. Some challenges are just basic GIS. Um, and I hope to highlight that today. Um, so before we dive into supply chain, let's just get a quick refresher on GIS in the real world. Um, so if you're watching this, you might already have some familiarity with GIS, but let's go over a practical example that highlights how we interact with these systems every day. Um, if you've ever been house shopping or, or apartment shopping and, and you find that right place, what factors make it good? Um, I'm not talking about you know, stainless steel appliances or a laundry room on like the second floor. Um, we're thinking, is it, is it in a good school district? Um, what's the distance from this house to my, my work? What's the commute like? Or, or what's the land value like in comparison um, to the properties around me? Um, or more likely, rather than each one independently, it's some kind of weighted matrix of all three of these kind of balancing out in your head together. Well, GIS allows us to break down that conceptualization into what we call layers of information. So think of a map of the distance to the metro um, or the distance to the parks and the amenities and the restaurants. Um, and then another map of the distance to your work, all stacked on top of one another. And then you take this information and then you have a detailed understanding of a particular place on the map. Well, the same workflow is gonna be used by the government and commercial groups to understand things like where do we put a restaurant that serves a tar target demographic or um, where's the best place to put a library? Without GIS, each of these pieces of information would exist separately. Um, but fortunately, geography is that glue that binds information together. Everything occurs somewhere. 
Um, so this is more than just making pretty maps and GIS can do a really good job at that, but it's really about using location to make very difficult decisions quickly with a whole range of information. All right, so what does all of that have to do with building a resilient supply chain for COVID-19? Um, well, it's because there's a very similar planning and information framework. You're going to have to, you know, rather than selecting an apartment and a house and a restaurant, uh, select manufacturing facilities that have the optimal distance to the demand. Um, you have to create navigational routes for thousands of workers and vehicles uh, through the optimal territory to save both money and energy. Uh, you have to monitor your destination facilities for disasters that could further disrupt distribution. And then once that chain is built, uh, you just casually have to deal with this thing called supply and demand. But to top it all off, uh, this is going to be made significantly more complex by the specific impacts of COVID-19, um, like the new and emerging hotspots of cases, um, the impacts of social vulnerability, um, the impact that the need for these resources, and above all else, uncertainty, because we've never dealt like something like this before. Um, but not to worry, this is all spatial information. Um, if we layer our facilities and our routes with inclement weather, uh, we can get a forecast of not just snowfall, but the impact to the supply chain if one facility were to close. Uh, and if we layer population estimates with our distribution centers, we can get an accurate prediction of demand at each facility. Uh, and because this is occurring within a GIS, we can model it over and over again. Um, so when something bad happens, um, there's almost no impact to those at the receiving end of the chain. Or at least proceed. Um, and this isn't conceptual, this is a real concern. And, and we've seen time and time again where the, the sole manufacturer of a critical element of a pharmaceutical or of rubber gloves um, is in a region that's hit by a natural disaster. So using GIS to plan for these vulnerabilities, it allows us to avoid the worst case scenario. Um, like where, again, hypothetically here, you have a COVID-19 vaccine, but the manufacturer who makes the bottles was hit by a blizzard. And so you, you can't get the product to the end user. So that was a good deal of, of background here into the fundamentals of GIS, but let's get technical and let's see how we can use specific tools uh, to gather intelligence to pre-plan scenarios, and then observe and adapt to keep our supply chain running. And we're gonna do this for both national, national distribution and also for local distribution, um, which is a little bit different. So the map we're looking at here is what we call a common operating picture or a COP. Um, it's, it's arguably the most simple application of GIS, um, which also makes it the most widely used. With, with modern GIS, um, the layers of information, they're not really stored locally uh, in most cases anymore. They stream in over what we call services. Um, so in this example, we have weather coming in from NOAA. We have earthquake data, live earthquake data coming in from USGS. Uh, and then finally, we have our data that we're contributing here, which is our supply chain, our manufacturing facilities and distribution centers and, and the routes uh, layered in the middle of all of it. Uh, and then as the data updates from those sources, it's also gonna update here on our COP. This is where GIS takes it to the next level. Uh, you can build a system or a script that says, all right, every minute, I'm gonna look for the overlap between these layers. Um, so if there's a severe weather alert within 10 miles of a major hub, I want you to send me an alert. Um, and that's something that you just can't do with a table of information. You have to account for space and location. Otherwise, you'll see an alert for the zip code of say 21771, uh, but your facility is in 21770. And so you know, on table, everything's okay. Um, but next thing you know, you have no staff working because they all got snowed in in the, in the neighboring zip code. Um, and so the culmination of, of all this kind of spatial thinking is what we see on the left-hand side here. Um, it's that location intelligence saying, you know, not all these layers X, Y, and Z, but facility three, alert. That's it, it just gives you an actionable piece of information that doesn't necessarily even require reading a map. It's just intelligence and information. Um, and so that's where, again, it gets really critical here that we can, we can bring this data together. Um, it's a lot like the difference of someone giving you the readout of, of barometric pressure um, versus just telling you to grab an umbrella. Um, we wanna just tell you to grab an umbrella. Um, with COVID-19 supplies, um, we can actually even use, rather than live weather data, 
we can use historical weathering patterns uh, to find the most vulnerable facilities um, and their routes and then start planning alternates before anything bad actually even happens. Um, but let's say hypothetically, uh, we want to start doing this pre-planning of scenarios. We wanna model what happens if a facility goes offline, um, like hypothetically a hurricane were to shut down a distribution center. Well, by layering the serviced population or, or the demand, these are future people, with our supply chain, we can actually make an accurate estimation of the impact of closing one facility. Um, so in this case, we see that losing this facility um, would have caused most of Florida to become unserviced. Now that wouldn't be great, um, but it might be possible then in our GIS to add another facility in the same general region and it would pick up the demand and keep things running. But as we move up the supply chain, things get far more complex and the stakes get far higher. So for example, um, if we move a major distribution hub from the system, uh, it actually impacts the entire East Coast. Um, and GIS can show us the, the exact sub distribution sites and the communities that would be impacted if that facility went out. Um, so up until now, we've kind of been acting in, in reaction to these events. Um, but what if, kind of like I had mentioned earlier, we got ahead of the ball? What if we tasked our GIS to make a plan? So if any given facility went offline, there was a backup plan ready to go. Now, again, we're talking about the power of GIS. Um, in, in this example on the, on the screen here, we're looking at a GIS function, it's called location and allocation. Um, so for every county in the US, the tool assigns the nearest distribution site um, that will be responsible for servicing it. And it goes over and over again, iterates through every single county in the nation. Um, and it can work at any scale. Um, these tools can even account for traffic and, and blockages related to the storm. So if um, you know a road gets shut down, it would maybe potentially reroute a county to a different distribution site. Um, so what this means is that we can create an unlimited number of models. Um, some people use the phrase digital twins um, that are gonna show us a few things. Uh, it's gonna show us digitally, what do things look like under normal operations, which is when everything is orange here. Um, and then we see what happens if we shut down a facility and then we see another facility pick up that load. And we can even calculate if that added load is going to strain the system or if we need to, um, in the third case here, bring in a backup facility, which is highlighted here in green uh, on the screen very quickly. Um, so what we see here is there's that word that we use in the description of this talk. It's, it's a resilient supply chain. Um, it's not a supply chain where every element is unbreakable. Uh, that's unrealistic. And that's how the Titanic got into trouble. Um, but it's this chain where if something breaks, there's no surprises. Um, there's active monitoring. And then there's this robust plan for every single facility to keep parts moving. There's backups and, and reiterations of this data set. Um, so that's where GIS is just so cool. All right, well, up until this point, we were national. We were, we were successful at getting our supplies and our vaccines and our, our PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, down to a regional distribution center. Um, and that might just be a few places within each state or potentially every county. Um, but now we need to get that last mile delivery uh, to actual people, to the clinics, to the pharmacies where they're going to be used and injected and, um, and given to actual citizens. Well, GIS is actually really gonna help us with this as well. Um, so let's take that vaccination example again. We know that it's not going to be ready all at once. Um, it's going to be released in phases, uh, specifically uh, three phases, where first responders and, and those at a risk of severe COVID-19 are at the, the very front of the line. Well, because geography, again, is this glue that binds information together, uh, we can get a layer of hospital information to see the number of healthcare workers. And we can get a layer of market potential data um, to see who's buying inhalers and who's buying insulin. And we can get a, a layer of demographics from the U.S. Census. And suddenly, GIS has given us this framework and these estimated groupings of how much the population falls into each phase in the community. Um, this is going to give local governments the ordering estimates they need um, to give to the national supplier to say, hey, here's how much of each vaccine dose um, that we need in each of the phases. Um, again, it wouldn't be possible without being able to bind that information together inside of GIS. GIS is also going to allow us to account for an ongoing situation like active COVID-19 cases. Um, so what we have here on the map is a sample data set of COVID-19 cases. Each dot is, is one, one case that someone had at one point. And, and point data can be very helpful when there's a, a small number of clusters or a few cases 
um, where you can easily look at a map and say, okay, it's going on here, here, and here, and here. Well, with something as widespread as COVID-19, point data maps don't help us out too much. Um, all I see here is just the outline of, of a sample region. Um, but using GIS, we can actually create information products that tell a much more detailed story. We can use a process called emerging hotspot analysis. Um, well, we're not going to just see a, a hotspot or a cumulative case count of cases forever um, because that really won't help out too much. Um, but we're going to find these areas where things have been intensifying over time and where they are currently intensifying, um, which would be these bright red areas on this map. Um, so imagine you had an area with a, a massive spike in COVID-19 cases, um, but it since started to dramatically decline. Um, maybe, hypothetically, I haven't seen a case of this yet, um, they've reached herd immunity from just uh, natural infection and you know the, the most that's happened there has happened. Um, well, in that case, you might want to prioritize a different neighborhood where cases are still very much on the rise, again, in this hypothetical scenario. Um, well, these are the areas where things are on the rise where the vaccine is going to be extremely helpful. Um, and it should be considered and it's being considered by many counties to make these distribution decisions. Um, so now you get to kind of wrap your head around that on, on GIS day. It's not just about space, um, it's also about time as that third or fourth dimension, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and finally here, GIS can ingest data from the CDC on social vulnerability. Uh, we've seen this um, kind of throughout the pandemic that those who are in highly vulnerable categories are being hit the hardest by severe COVID-19 um, for a number of reasons. Then by adding this index into our calculations, we're ensuring equitable access to those resources for those who need it most. So let's bring it back again to this concept of location intelligence. Taking all of this information together, um, we've got the total population in each phase as a layer. We've got a layer of the status of COVID-19 in that region. And then we have this new layer from CDC, the, the social vulnerability index. We can combine all of these together into GIS into what is called a risk surface. Um, this is a weighted surface that tells us what communities relative to each other to focus on first, given whatever input factors we want to we, we want to add to the system. Now, in most GIS software, you can actually even calibrate that weight. So, say focusing seventy percent on on social vulnerability and thirty percent on emerging hotspots, or, or vice versa. Um, the controls can get extremely finite, even considering you know, the capacity of how many vaccines might be available. Um, but ultimately, it's some pretty basic algebra just kind of put into the spatial conceptualization, which means that when it's finally time after all of this supply chain talk and finally getting the vaccine ready to go and it's time to distribute it, the GIS can use the risk surface uh, and place resources not just where there's the most people, um, which is what we saw kind of early on with COVID-19 testing, you know, testing sites being put in just large cities and, and people in the rural areas didn't have access, um, but we're actually now able to place resources where they are needed most. Um, so, for example, imagine two neighboring towns, um, each with one potential distribution site, uh, and we as the city planners or the local health department have to pick one. Now, one town has uh, you know, a very affluent population. Everyone owns a vehicle. And then right next door, a neighborhood is, is less affluent, and there's many homes that, that don't have a vehicle. They, they might not be able to drive to go get a vaccine if it was far away. That's actually a metric that influences the CDC Social Vulnerability Index way. Um, but using that kind of weight within our GIS, the tool will place the resource in the town with the greatest need, which is going to skew towards this ensuring of equitable access to resources, um, which again is, is super technical and super you know, nerdy GIS, but the impact in the real world is, is astronomical and so, so impactful. Um, then with the move forward towards web GIS, or you may hear the phrase enterprise GIS, um, you can create browser-based simulations, um, which means that anyone with a computer now, without GIS software on their laptop, uh, without this, this severe technical know-how or the number of degrees on their wall, um, they can now just log into a browser and see the impact of adding a new distribution facility in one place versus another, just with a click of a mouse and, and very limited know-how of GIS. Um, and you can even build mobile applications that will navigate citizens to their nearest distribution site, which again is a huge part of this, um, this supply and demand thing of actually getting people to be able to access these resources. Um, and so kind of finally here, kind of bringing it all to kind of an end point, 
we're seeing that GIS, especially now that COVID-19 is um, kind of in the middle of our lives, it's no longer just a group of people who have been working in the, in the basement office printing paper maps all day. Uh, granted, that's still an important role, and that's how you know I got my start in GIS was you know, printing maps in the basement. Um, but instead, it, it's expanding out into this capability that is so central uh, to combining layers of information into something actionable um, that can be interacted with by anyone, regardless of their GIS experience. Um, so um, if you're interested in learning more, or if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email at mscholin uh, at esri.com. It's on the screen right there. Um, but most importantly, uh, thank you so much um, to you all and thank you to the Library of Congress. Um, please stay safe and happy GIS Day 2020. Hello, everyone. I'm John Hessler. I'm a specialist in computational geography and GIS at the Library of Congress. And today I'm going to talk about mapping the mutations of COVID-19. Now, COVID-19, um, obviously, we've had um, some papers before mine which talked about cases and talked about numbers. But we're going to go a little bit deeper into the cartography of actually tracking the mutations around the world. Uh, and this really gives us a really good sense and a really good idea um, of how the virus has moved around the planet. And we're going to use some really technical and, and, and advanced ways of doing this, which combine both cartography and geospatial data, uh, along with phylogenetics. So we're going to begin by talking about the structure of the coronavirus itself. And this is really going to be important when we start talking about mapping mutations, because we're going to have to talk really specifically about certain structures and certain parts of the coronavirus. Now, the coronavirus is an RNA virus, and what that really means is that it's part of a, a whole family of emerging viruses that of late have come to the fore. Um, we don't really know why RNA viruses have become so prevalent uh, in zoonotic and in emerging disease at this point. Um, but it's just one of a group of viruses that have sort of emerged from animal hosts in recent years. Uh, it has a small, very small genome, so we're only talking about 30,000 base pairs, 30,000 nucleotides, and it has a super high mutation rate. And the real thing that we're going to concentrate on uh, in a lot of the talk is really the spike protein, really these spikes that are coming out of the, of the capsid of the virus, which kind of give the virus really its name, and it's called the coronavirus because it, it looks like a crown. Now, when we talk about mapping mutations, what we're really going to be doing is we're really going to be looking at how the various mistakes and how the various mutations that accumulate in the virus as it has moved around the world. And so on the left-hand side of your screen right here, you see a phylogenetic tree uh, with all sorts of colors. And every one of the dots that you see there is a different genome that has been sequenced after the virus has been inside a human host. And on the right side, what you see is you see how those mutations have moved around the world. Um, the phylogenetics and the mutations are color-coded to the map, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that in just a bit. Um, and on the bottom of your screen, what you really see is you see the sequence of the genome itself. Um, and that graph at the bottom um, shows the mutations in each of the different points um, in the genome um, and how many there are. So the, the larger the little line coming up from the base there, um, the more mutations, then the more frequency of the mutations at those particular sites. Um, and we'll get into this in, in, in some detail. Now, all of this has been made possible just recently. This is really one of the first pandemics um, or large-scale outbreaks of disease where we've been able to map um, the phylogenetics and, and the geospatial movement of the mutations of the virus around the world in real time. And that's really taken place simply because there are organizations like GIS AID, which are bringing together all of the genome sequences that we've seen done around the world into one place. Uh, and it allows qualified researchers like myself to go in there and actually pull out um, all of those genome sequences and actually map them and look at what's, what's going on with them. Um, the other group that has been really important is a group called NextStrain. NextStrain has built a platform 
an open source platform where we've been able to use the data from GSI AID to actually tr track in real time the actual evolution of, of the coronavirus. Um, and so we'll be talking a lot about um, the data from GSID and the, the platform of NextStrain. Um, so all of the data and all of the uh, visualizations that you're going to see in this presentation are for the most part come from those two sources. So we're gonna begin by kind of just talking really briefly about a phylogenetic tree. Um, this is the actual tree of the coronavirus. Uh, what we see here is we see all of the mutations. Um, as I said before, every one of these dots is a genome sequence. Um, they're color-coded to each of the places where each of these tests uh, and each of these genomes originates. Um, and you'll see that um, divided this up into six basic regions. Um, and we'll be talking in a little bit more detail actually about North America more specifically than, than the global um, phylogenetic tree that you see here. But really what this is, is it shows us the relationship um, of the mutation. So in other words, if a, a virus comes into a human host and it mutates, in other words, if the genome changes in some random way um, in some place, and then I pass that disease on to a next person, those mutations will travel with, with, with that disease, with that virus entering the other person. And in tracking these mutations, which are in a way mistakes in the genome, um, we can track as, how the virus has moved around the planet. And that's really what we're gonna be focusing on he here. So if we blow that tree up, so in other words, what we're doing is we're, we're zeroing in and kind of expanding that tree. And we're looking at um, a snapshot of just a specific area here. And what this is actually showing us is really the first case that entered the United States, and that was in, into Washington state. What you see on the left-hand side in the purple are all of the various um, mutations and all of the various genome sequences that were done in Asia and China in the earliest days of the outbreak. And so what we can see here is we can see that red dot. That red dot signifies North America, red is North America. And we can see that the first Washington state case came from um, China. It actually came from uh, a group of mutations that are coming from Asia. And then you can see that that red dot expands into this huge mass of other red dots. And that is actually um, tracking the, the virus as it spreads into, um, into North America. Now, if we go to another part of the tree, so this basic tree here, the Washington case state that we just talked about cases down here, and, and we can then expand the tree to look a little bit deeper, a little bit further out. Again, these are all of the mutations in purple that are coming from Asia. And then we see here this branch, uh, which is a branch that is coming from the larger Wuhan group, in other words, the larger um, place where this virus originated in, in, in China. Um, and we see that it's expanding into, into Europe. So basically this particular branch here is the first cases um, in green that are coming into Europe. And we've been able to do this. We've been able to actually look at the geospatial mapping of the disease in this way, simply because we have three things. We've got the time um, that the genome is actually sequenced. So we have an idea of when the person whose genome is being sequenced actually got sick. Um, we have the genome itself. In other words, we have a real tracking of all the mutations and all of the um, various nucleotides and amino acids in the virus itself. And then we have where the person was. So we've got these three things which are, allow us to basically trace a network of transmission around the world. Now, if we blow this up again, we down here, we see that original part that we just showed originating in France. And then we see this, this, this branch here spreading out into Europe. And these are European cases. And of course, the red or North American cases. Um, but then we see these particular branches um, up at the top. And so what this actually tells us is these are the actual mutations that are coming into New York. Um, the sequences um, on the right-hand side, these dot sequences are, are from New York City, as are some of the, the, the cases down here. And so what this basically has allowed us to ascertain is that there are two introductions of the, of the coronavirus into the United States. Um, there's one in Washington, which is coming, Washington State, coming directly 
um, from China, from the Chinese um, cases and the Asian cases. And then we see another group, which is actually coming from the European branch. Um, and so we see these two independent introductions. At the time um, of the European introduction, um, there had been flight restrictions coming from China, but there are no travel restrictions coming from Europe. So we see this introduction um, coming from a European source into New York. So using the phylogenetic tree, um, using the mutations and, and using the, the geospatial data associated with those, we've actually been able to determine um, that there are these two important introductions um, in, into, the, into the US. Now we can blow this up even more. And really this is just to give you an idea of how complex um, a problem tracing and tracking um, the virus has actually been. So we can see here, we've, we've blown the, the, shrunk the tree back down and there is that case, that first case coming into the United States from Washington state. You see a little bit below that, also from the Asian branches, there's two introductions into Illinois and one into Arizona. But if we really expand that Washington state case, we can see here this entire sequence of related places that these genomes um, come to and, and that, that went to. So we can see Texas, we can see Ecuador, we can see New Zealand, um, all of which are associated with this group of mutations that are the same as the Washington state case. Um, so in trying to track how the virus moved around the world in, in these early stages, um, we see the, really the complexity of travel. We see the complexity of, of how people in the early stages of the pandemic were mixing. Um, and this is something that right now we just have so much data that we're trying to look at. Um, it's going to be a long time before uh, cartographers and epidemiologists really get a handle on exactly how the virus moved during these early parts of the pandemic. Uh, what's important now is we have so much data, so much geospatial data, and so much possibility for mapping um, the genome um, that we're going to find out a lot of information about this pandemic, more than we've probably had for any other outbreak of any other disease um, in history. Um, and so it's going to be a long sequence of, of investigations, but this is kind of the, the data that we're, we're working through right now. Now, this can be even more fine grained. Um, when we talk about the Washington um, int introduction into Washington, that first introduction, we can see there's actually even two introductions in into actual Washington state. Um, and one that comes out of a, a very large outbreak, which basically had 384 um, sampled genomes after it. Um, and then a second introduction, which is a smaller outbreak, a smaller phylogenetic tree, as you can see, um, with 39 samples. Um, and in this case, I'm not looking at time down the bottom here, but actually looking at the number of mutations. And really this allows us to kind of follow the, the, the trail of each of these introductions as it spreads, as it fans out across the country and across the world. Um, and so when we start looking at, at these and we start looking at how it travels from Washington state and then moves across North America, um, it's a very complicated network, but we have the data to actually be able to figure it out. And that's really what we're, we're kind of mapping at this point. Now, why is this important? Why is it important to really track the, the, the and, and map the, the mutations? Well, one of the things that COVID-19 is, it, it seems to be optimized um, in its jump from bats or pangolins or whoever it, it made the jump, whatever animal it actually made the jump from, it seems to be optimized to bind to what's called an ACE2 human receptor. And this is the way that the, 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 the virus actually links itself up um, with a human cell. And this, this, uh, respect, this, this, this linkage happens um, when a virus cell or when the, the vi a virion, one of these little pieces of virus actually um, links itself up um, with, with a human cell. And it does that by attaching its spike protein. And, and these are the spikes. And there's a per particular proteins that are in these spikes. And it also happens to be one of the most uh, variable parts of the, of the actual genome. Um, this is a computer 
uh, reconstruction, uh, molecular reconstruction of what the, the molecular structure of the coronavirus looks like. Um, and as it is basically coming to attach itself to this ACE2 receptor in a human cell. Now, one of the things we've been able to look at um, is a particular mutation in this area. Um, so this is the, the actual spike proteins. And one of the things that's been happening is there's been mutations occurring in this particular region of the genome. In other words, in the proteins that, that structure the spike proteins. And in the last couple of weeks, um, there has been a couple of very important papers on a mutation called D614G. And this is basically an amino acid change that occurred at the 614 location in the genome. And it's been a very important um, mutation to track um, simply because it doesn't seem to be affecting the mortality um, or the severity of the disease, but it does seem to be giving us hints that it is making the disease, um, uh, allowing it to attach to human cells in a, in a much more efficient manner. And where this actually occurs, so this is the, a blow up of the spike protein. Um, and so it's occurring at, at some very important locations in the spike protein. Uh, this is where the receptor binding domain is. And these top proteins here, these top areas are really where the first contact um, of the virion comes into when it attaches it to a cell. Now, if we decide to map um, this genome, this, 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 um, the genome and, and this uh, particular uh, mutation. What we can see is that um, now we're not told, we haven't colored this based on, um, based on geography. I've colored it based on the switch in mutation. So the, the turquoise at the bottom re keeps the D um, amino acid. And then at the 614 location, when it mutates into um, uh, when it mutates, we, we see the, the, the yellow here. Uh, and this is really important because what we've been able to look at is when we look at the cases um, and you look at this, you can see that there's a huge number of cases um, after it's expanded out of Asia. Um, this, this encompasses almost all of the, the European and North American outbreak. Uh, and what we see, and we can see this in the pattern of actual cases in the early part of the pandemic, um, we, we don't see very many um, of cases with this mutation. But then when we get into July, we see a huge spike um, in this mutation traveling through um, the cases that we've been able to look at. And so in mapping these uh, mutations, we can start to look at exactly the way the disease has changed where it has changed, how it has spread, and then some of the important mutations that have been occurring around the world, um, and really what their effect has been happening on the, on the transmittability of, of the disease itself. And as I said, all of this has been done by the combination of um, really complicated phylogenetics um, and GIS and, and mapping resources. Um, it's important to, to, to understand that these are in fact models. Um, we don't have all of the data, so every, all the conclusions that I'm drawing are based on the fact that I've only looked at a certain percentage of the genomes. Obviously, um, not every person who's had coronavirus um, has had their genome sequenced. Um, and we're really only talking now about 150,000 complete genome sequences of the millions of cases. So we're working with limited data, but we think the trends that we're looking at are, are are um, predictive and representative of, of what's going on, on in, in the cases around the world. Now, the last thing I'm gonna mention is the fact that we see um, really five um, basic clades. Um, in other words, five basic overall families of mutations that, that have occurred during the pandemic up until now. Um, there's the, the two branches down here, the one in turquoise and the one in blue, um, which are really prevalent in Asia during the first months uh, of the pandemic. Then we have this major um, clade, which is called 20A. And this is where the European um, outbreak begins. And we really see two European outbreaks, a really large one and then a smaller one um, that happens a little bit uh, later. Um, and then of course, up in here called 20C, is the North American outbreak. Now, when we map these, when we actually map the, 
the, the representation of, of, of these clades across the planet, um, which is shown on the left-hand side here. We can see, for instance, in the United States that this particular group of mutations is, of course, dominant in the United States, but we still have representative mutations um, of all of the other clades uh, in the US and pretty much around the world. You can see that even though that these clades began and are, and are somewhat geographically isolated and prevalent in particular areas, that they have mixed across the entire spectrum um, of the world. Um, so this is really where we are right now in, in, in the research and in the network mapping of the, of the coronavirus based on mutations. Um, as I said, it's a very complicated and, and, and data-rich area of research right now. Um, we're running lots of different kinds of mathematical models and, and Bayesian uh, analysis on this. Um, there's some machine learning algorithms that have been started to work into this data so we can uh, map it a little bit more precisely. But in effect, um, at this point, obviously the cases are growing, um, the data is growing, and we at this point see no end in sight to the analysis and data that we um, have available. And I want to thank everyone for, um, for uh, listening, uh, and I want to thank you all for um, coming in and, um, and uh, participating in the Library of Congress's uh, GIS Day for 2020. Thanks very much.